So um, my journey. So I grew up in, oh, and first thing I should say is that I, and Erica already knows this because I've, I've uh, taught at girls right now before or led workshops here. I close my eyes a lot when I talk because that's just how I think. Um, so, so don't be alarmed. So I, um, I, how did I come to writing? What was my journey? I grew up in a um, household where my parents were immigrants from the West Bank, um, which is in, Palis in a part of Palestine. And I was first generation. Um, and so I was often spending my summers, you know, traveling back and forth between the US and the Middle East. And I spent a few years of my life living in the Middle East. And I found that I often felt like I was sort of an outsider. And in a way, this was really alienating. But at the same time, it gave me a unique perspective from which to observe, um, observe people and just observe situations. And I think that a lot of that outsider status is what brought me to writing, um, was that desire to really make sense of what I was seeing, especially since I was seeing it from a distance. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, growing up in an Arab family, we didn't really, um, you know, it, it's often the case with immigrant families where your career path is something more, you know, I guess creative writing, let's just say creative writing wasn't something that was really an option. Um, it wasn't something my parents were against. It just wasn't, it just wasn't even in, you know, it just wasn't in the ether of our household. So I studied foreign affairs and philosophy as an undergraduate. And then I um, began working at magazines and found that I was just really drawn to writing. And I, one day, um, well, there was a war that broke out in the Middle East between Hezbollah and Israel. And I was really affected by it uh, as a Palestinian American. And I wrote, a, a personal essay basically about my response to this and I sent it out and it somebody got published in a in a newspaper called the Christian Science Monitor which is now not really around but anyway so from there I just kept writing nonfiction and personal essays and then I found that I really wanted to I wanted to um, kind of challenge a lot of stereotypes and misperceptions that I was encountering around Arabs and Muslims. And it seemed as though, you know, I wanted to kind of do so without the, re without the reader really knowing that that was exactly what I was trying to do in some way, right? Or that it was sort of more subversive. And fiction, right, was a way to do that, where I could create characters that happened to be Arab and Muslim, and um, they could be in the world just doing normal things. So that was part of what led me to writing fiction and to writing my novel. And just kind of going back a little bit, I, um, I, you know, I, 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 I was living in New York and working in international affairs because I. I ended up doing a master's in that. And then I just kept wanting to write all the time. <laughs> and it became harder and harder for me to um, focus on anything but writing. So I applied for an MFA and I got into Iowa and I moved to Iowa. And that's where I wrote most of my, most of my novel. Um, so the, you know, in terms of this, particular book, as I said, for one thing, I wanted to really challenge um, stereotypes and assumptions around um, Arabs and Muslims. And at the same time, you know, I, I, I wanted to see aspects of my own identity reflected in literature. <laughs> I, I, growing up, I, I didn't often encounter um, many characters in the books I was reading who, who looked like me and who embodied a lot of the contradictions that I myself embody. 
um, by virtue of being both Arab and American and by virtue of being both, I don't know, having a sort of a lot of various in betweennesses um, which kind of manifest in the protagonist of my novel. And a lot of these in betweennesses, they just, they're very, they're messy, they overlap, they don't fall into easy categories. So I wanted to create a character um, who, where these messy, where this messiness and this, these intersections and this in betweenness was allowed to exist. Uh, and so that's another reason. That's another part of what brought me to writing this book. Um, and then process wise, I, um, yeah, it took me a long, a long time to write this book. And I spent a lot of time writing, but I also spent a lot of time just thinking and going on long walks or long runs and letting the ideas that were shaping the book just marinate in my mind. Um, so stepping away from the book was a part of writing the book often. And it was a also a lot of revising. <laughs> and so part of the, in terms of, you know, getting it to the point of it being published, right, or selling it, and then it's going to be published actually in a week and a half, which is hmm, frightening. But um, that, that process, you know, it involved a lot of persistence, um, because there's a lot of you know, there are not always yeses along the way, you know, you'll, you will, or I, I should speak for myself, I would sometimes, um, I would seek out feedback, and it would be, you know, I get a lot of criticism in workshop, which was really painful at the time, and I would cry, <laughs> but it would make me, uh, after a few days, I would go home, and I would take that feedback, and I would, you know, incorporate incorporate the parts of it that resonated with me. Um, and then of course, sending it to agents. I, you know, there are some agents that said, said it wasn't for them, but they often were really generous and would give a note, you know, and say like maybe something they liked and something that needed to be developed. And once I got over the sting of them saying no, I would take that bit of feedback and I would incorporate it if it resonated. Right. And so, um, the agent that I ended up working with, she just saw the book in the exact way that I hoped someone would see it, which was really, really lovely. And the same was true with my editor, who she sold it to um, at Catapult, which is my publisher. And so, yeah, that, I mean, it, it, it's, a, for me, it was a process that involved a lot of just, you know, alone time writing, of course, and also a lot of persistence, but a lot of like joy along the way when I, when I felt I was really making breakthroughs in the writing. So uh, that's my, that's, that's that. <laughs> and then I'll read a little bit. I hope this isn't, I think my reading will probably take like seven minutes. Is that too long? Um, Cause you said 10 minutes, but I think seven minutes is enough. So I'm just gonna read from a section of the book and so that we have enough time to write. I'll just read from a section of the book that kind of speaks to this in some of the in-betweenness that I'm talking about. And it's set in, um, in Egypt, this section. The character is visiting Egypt. Okay, so I may, uh, hopefully I won't read too fast. Sometimes I do that. All right. The sky in Giza that morning was untainted, an uninterrupted expanse of blue. I climbed up a few rows of the Great Pyramid, dipping into the openings between the weathered limestones as Farah, my friend, stood at the base and snapped pictures with my camera. I inched my way back down and we waited in line to see the Sphinx, batting flies and taking in the cacophony of mostly Scandinavian languages around us. Tourists in hiking boots carrying large backpacks and clutching guidebooks. We got up close to the mythical cat and walked along her perimeter without ever actually touching her. Once we were done, we headed back to the parking lot to find a taxi. As we approached a cluster of cabs, I heard a voice call out behind me in English, ride the camel. I turned around to see a very old man with burnt rubber skin pointing to a camel draped in a red carpet and flanked by furry multicolored puffballs, its lips moving methodically as though it were chewing gum. A little boy stood on the other side of the animal, holding a rope as its reins. The old man smiled, revealing several missing teeth. He nodded at the boy, who then tapped the camel's knuckled knee and pulled on the rein, 
bringing the camel towards the ground. Witnessing the process was like watching a marble zigzag through a maze. First, the camel sloped backward, then forward, then backward again, until its legs were folded neatly beneath it. I grabbed the pommel and swung my right leg over the hump, placing my feet into the stirrups. I was afraid I might tumble forward as the camel began to stand up, jerking me back and forth until it was entirely upright. At 10 feet off the ground, the, uh, the air seemed cleaner, free from the smog enveloping Cairo. I straightened my back and indulged in a feeling of grandeur. The boy led the camel along and the three of us hobbled forward, a slow, steady dance, my hips rotating each time we took a step. Four minutes later, we were back at the point where we started. Farah and the old man were still standing there, waiting for us. Once again, the boy tugged the camel's rein and it began to descend. And again, I felt myself falling forward, then backward, then forward again, until the camel was kneeling. I slid off and stood up, brushing pieces of carpet from my pants. I then turned to the old man and asked, how much? He dropped his cigarette into the sand and buried it with his bare toe. Normally the price is $100, he said, but for you, he exhaled and smoke he'd been holding in his throat came forth. Because you're special, it's 50. I stared at him for a few seconds, certain I'd misunderstood. 50 US dollars? Yes, he said, down from 100. I looked at Farah, who simply shrugged. True, there was no price sheet to consult, but it seemed impossible that a hundred foot walk, camel or no camel, could cost that much. Then again, Farah was Egyptian, so wouldn't she know if this guy was swindling us? And if $50 was the going rate, then I didn't want to seem cheap by haggling over it. I pushed past my doubt and pulled out my wallet, depositing a 10 and two 20s into the old man's hand. He made a fist around the bills and smiled. Salam alaikum, peace be with you. Later that night, my mother and I had dinner at a seafood restaurant along the Nile. Ferry boats drifted by, blaring Arab mu Arabic music and casting bright lights onto the water. Despite the unseasonally cool temperature and jovial atmosphere, my mother could tell I was distraught. Shu, she asked, what's up? How much does a camel ride around the pyramids normally cost? I asked. <laughs> she reached for a pumpkin seed and cracked it open with her teeth. Two, three guinea? approximately 18 cents. Why, she asked, spitting out the shell. How much did you pay? I passed my napkin in front of my mouth as I answered. $50? <laughs> 50 US dollars? Was it a turbo-powered camel? No, but the guy said. Of course the guy said. Do you believe everything everyone tells you? I'd been swindled, of course. Why hadn't Farah said anything? Unless she'd been in on the deal, I saw no excuse for her ignorance. She was Egyptian, shouldn't she know better? Of course, the problem was that I should have known better. Um, though I'd been enjoying the role, I wasn't actually a tourist. But it's the idiosyncrasies of culture that keep me an outsider and leave me with a persistent and pervasive sense of otherness, of non-belonging. Basic but nuanced knowledge, the stuff that no one really teaches you. That an invitation for eight o'clock really means 9.30 in the Middle East. In Beirut, I once arrived at a rehearsal dinner on time, and the restaurant staff was still cleaning up from the night before. That no one wears flip-flops outside the house except to the pool. That noting one's weight gain is an expression of love, and that every price, rule, and border can and must be negotiated. And yet, in the U.S., I'm just as much of an outsider. Even though America is built upon the idea of assimilation, a so-called melting pot, we Arabs stand out. As a child, I was made starkly aware of our nonconformity when my friends would come over and ask why my parents were going out to dinner at 9 p.m. on a Tuesday. Why wasn't my mother wearing mom jeans, but rather form-fitting form leather, leather ones? Why did my father call me daddy and speak to me half in English, half in Arabic? Friends found it funny and harmless to tease me about my otherness. They'd even call me the terrorist, which I laughed along with, not fully processing nor having the courage to resist the insidious danger of such jokes, ones that a few years later would be deemed microaggressions or else blatant hate speech. Back then, to be different was simply a bad thing. Diversity wasn't yet something to be celebrated, and being white was necessary, if not sufficient, for acceptance. The white girls basked in the light while, the, while I suffered, I felt quietly in the lunchroom. 
The best we could hope to achieve was camaraderie among ourselves, united in our outcast status. It is a bizarre and unsettling feeling to exist in a liminal space between two realms, unable to attain full access to one or the other. $50 is the price of the camel itself, my mother said. So technically, I own the camel, I said. Yes, technically, she said. Make sure you declare it at customs. Okay, so that's an excerpt that um, I chose because I think it speaks to that cultural in-betweenness and the sort of, um, you know, awkwardness of it and sometimes the pain of it, right, in the case of like the narrator's childhood uh, memories. So I think that we should now do some writing <laughs> and I'm going to give you some prompts. All right. I wonder where we should begin. Let's see here. I think we should start by kind of warming up. Is that okay? Can everyone see the prompts or no? I um, can take them down if you want to do a warm up. Oh, no, no, no. I'm a little like, ahead. What I meant was, <laughs> the, uh, I, I was thinking that we would do the prompt one of the prompts that I think is a warm up to the other prompts. Gotcha. So the one, the describe, write about a place that has special meaning for you. Here it comes. Okay. And then I'll, so, so here is the first prompt. Okay. So I want you to write about a place or us, cause I'm going to do it too. Write about a place that has special meaning for you without specifying, you know, what exactly that place is, but showing us what that place is, right? Can be as broad as Paris or as narrow as the kitchen table at your mom's house. Um, in writing about it, I want you to also try and show why that place is special to you. So uh, when we say show versus tell, what I mean is like, we want to be able to see, right? Like if you wanted to say, um, she was, she was, she was sad, right? You would, instead of saying she was sad, you would show us she was sad. You would say she had tears dripping down her cheeks, right? We can see that and we can, we can decide and infer for ourselves that she's sad. So in this same way, I want to be able to sort of see this place and to also, um, in the way, in the writing, to see, for you to convey or to show why, why that place is special to you, okay? So why don't we take seven minutes? Is that good to do that? So we'll come back at like 631, 631. Awesome. Okay, cool. I will be doing it too.
I am both. Okay, so I want you to continue this, this fill, like finish this sentence and, go, and write from this sentence, right? So in doing so, think of a contradiction that exists within you, right? Like I'm both extroverted and introverted. I'm both messy and clean. I'm both American and Arab, right? And, and show us how you embody that contradiction, right? Maybe, um, you know, put yourself in a moment or allow us to see you in a moment where we can see both of those aspects of you at play, right? Um, and just what being both of those things looks like for you, right? Daniela, you kind of got at that a little bit when you talked about being naked and fully clothed and like that's a contradiction. So something, yeah, so take, so think about a contradiction that you embody and try and show us what that looks like for you. Show us you and being both. Okay, so again, spa, I'd say seven minutes. So 6.47, we'll come back.
All right. So this is the last prompt. This is the finale. Describe a time when you felt like a fish out of water, right? Uh, write a scene that shows us what that felt like. Maybe you were the only female identifying player on an all male identifying sports team, the only English speaker in the room, um, the new kid in class. So in, sh you know, in, in, in showing us that moment or that scene, was it initially unpleasant or difficult, but then did it become easier? Were you able to find your way into the pool while still being true to yourself? Um, so yeah, that's what the prompt is gonna be.
Okay, so why don't we, um, why don't we, we, we have time for some questions. <laughs> okay, so I, I have a few questions. Oh, wow, okay, I'm gonna, all right, what in, let's see here. Um, all right, I'll answer all these questions as much as I can. So when did you discover that you're, oh, okay, wow, good question, all right. When did you discover that your differences, your outsiderness empowers you when you write? I think I discovered that when I started writing from that perspective and I found myself feeling a lot less lonely. And then I would, when I started publishing things that you know, were written from that perspective, editors were really hungry for it, that voice. You know, they wanted more because it was a voice that was really unfamiliar and um, just less heard. So that's when, you know, both on a personal level and then on that in a professional sense where I discovered that my differences, right, and my outsiderness empowered me when I wrote. So um, how do you get out of writer's block and what keeps you motivated? Um, I, I mean, a writer's block happens, you know, and sometimes part of when I said like you have to write every day or as much as, you know, create a routine, sometimes that writing time for me is literally just sitting in front of the computer staring at Microsoft Word and a blank page, you know, and I accept that. Um, and often to get around that, I'll, I'll go for a walk and I'll just like let, you know, observe the world because like <laughs> in order to write, you know, you need to also have experiences and observations, right? And thoughts. So I will go out into the world and that will be a part of my writing process. Um, how do you find the drive? Um, yeah, how do you find the drive to write even after rejection and feeling like your writing isn't good enough? You have to just believe in yourself. I mean, that's an honest answer, right? Is you, like, so much of writing is about persisting and believing in what you're writing and believing in what you're doing. And, and, and no matter what, you know, um, no matter if you, you know, there is rejection, some, of course, there, there's, it's, you know, there always, there is. And um, that's why it's so important to just have faith in what you're doing. Because yeah, I mean, there are people, there are so many people, so many different kinds of readers, so many different tastes and preferences. And, you know, what one person's may really not respond well to what you're writing, but another person, it might just change, it might really speak to them. It might be something they really needed to read. And that's just when I, when I get feedback like that, it's an amazing, it, it motivates me. Um, so, <laughs> I, let's see here. Ah, I'm sorry. I, okay, what inspired you to be a writer? I, a lot of what inspired me was a desire to, um, uh, yeah, see myself reflected, but also to I think feel less alone and like really writing becomes a sort of companion. So that's, that's that. Uh, where, where did you get your undergraduate degree? UVA, University of Virginia. Uh, I like this question. Um, do you think hobbies define us more than our nationality because they, they're personal choices that we make or do we also choose to embrace a certain culture and write about, I think, what's so cool about like writing and hobbies is that, yeah, you're choosing them, right? They are, um, you get to define yourself on those terms, whereas it's true nationality and like your cultural background, you don't really get to, you know, you often don't get to decide those things. So I think that's part of why writing is so empowering and other hobbies as well, you know? Um, to me, I identify first and foremost as a writer, you know, and then I identify as Palestinian American and then and a woman and all the other identity markers that are within me. Um, let's see here. How, how did you remember so much from your travels? Actually, this, it's fiction, like it's a novel. So I made up, I made it up basically. Um, the character, in this case, it's the character who is, you know, in between and struggling with that aspect of her identity. But when I write, Nonfiction. I take, I record, I bring like a tape record. I always ask if I can record um, if I'm interviewing someone and I, I take tons of notes, pictures, just anything that would help me remember. What impact do you want your writing to have? I want it to help make someone else feel less alone. 
you know? Because like when I, again, when I was growing up, I just didn't see writers that, or characters that looked like me. I never, really, in all the ways that I, in many of the ways that I existed, I just didn't see that reflected. And sometimes I will, a reader will say to me, like, it was so good to see a depiction of like an LGBTQ character, right? Um, and especially one that's like Middle Eastern, <laughs> Arab. Uh, and that, I, I know what they mean when they say that. So that's really rewarding. What's, um, and I want my impact in my writing to be, I guess, just, yeah, enjoyable as well. Let's see, what do you, how do you write, uh, consistently write about identity without being redundant, right? I, right, without telling, without, because there are so many narratives to tell within that umbrella of identity and so many ways to arrive at identity. Um, and I think of specific experiences or situations that I can put characters in and often they'll arrive at the same larger theme, but it's the specific story that's different, right? Often they say a writer like spends their career circling around just a few ideas, um, but they find totally different ways of exploring those ideas, right? Totally different characters, storylines. How do your parents feel about your career? Wow. Um, well, <laughs> they've accepted that I'm just gonna do what I wanna do, really. <laughs> like, I think that sometimes they're proud of me. Um, I think they're proud of me. But I think that they are just like, where did you come up with this idea of being a writer? Like, we don't have that. You know, that wasn't, that is not a thing in this family. But that's okay. They love me nonetheless, I think. So how do you write even when you don't feel like it? Yesterday, I didn't feel like it. Yesterday, I was really down. I just felt just melancholy and just sad yesterday. I did not feel like writing. So I, I tried to write, I did write like maybe a sentence, maybe two, maybe one and a half. And then I just went outside um, and I went on a socially distanced walk <laughs> and I just let myself be sad and feel my feelings and accept that like to that day I was going to write only one sentence and that was okay. Because part of being a writer is also being a person with feelings and down times and just like a lot of emotions that can make it hard to write on a particular day. Um, huh, how, I like this question. How has COVID affected you as a writer? Um, I mean, you know, it's made me, I guess, really. Um, a lot a really reflective to be honest as I think many people feel really reflective during this time um, it's made me really reflective and it's made me fight that much harder to carve out the headspace needed to write because there's so much you know noise in the world like so much news and just a lot to think about and a lot to worry about and so every morning I wake up I try and wake up as early as I can before any of that infiltrates my head and really protect that writing time are your friends writers? Not all of them. I mean, a lot of them are because I really found my people at my MFA program. You know, I finally felt like I belonged somewhere. So those people are my friends. And a lot of them live in New York, which is where I live. But I have a lot of friends from other aspects of life. And I love that, that are not writers because I just learned so much from them, which I can bring to my writing. But also it's just, you know, you don't need to be around writers all the time to write. Um, so yeah i think i think that's it <laughs> uh i answered those i hope those answers were helpful to you i wish i still had the ability to unmute everybody so that we could give you a huge round of applause oh, but please you. feel free to unmute yourselves to thank, thank you. dana this was wonderful thank you thank you thank you so much yeah this is